Welcome to our uh, Google Hangout Part 2, Revisiting the Children's Internet Protection Act. In this second Hangout, we will continue the conversation discussing the uh, recommendations and the themes and a summary of the symposium that was held yesterday here in the Washington Google offices to, to um, talk about the long-term imp uh, impacts of implementing CIPA. And I will turn over the screen to our first presenter who will give you some background. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Zimmer, and I'm in a I'm faculty at the School of Information Studies at the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee. What we want to talk about in this second uh, hangout is a framework that we were spending the afternoon developing. Uh, after the morning discussion of yesterday's symposium, dealing with uh, the background and some of the things that we heard in the first hangout, uh, we spent the afternoon working on some frameworks trying to help us uh, discuss, understand, and address how filtering content for young people might be having an impact on their long-term capacity to develop critical thinking skills, to become productive and engaged adults, uh, to ultimately contribute in our 21st century uh, information environment. And our discussions focused on the roles of government policy, uh, schools and education, library services, uh, concerns over equitable access, and drafting research questions uh, to improve our understanding of this information environment. So our hope is that sort of building out this multi-pronged framework, we can help guide policy discussions, uh, guide community discussions, um, uh, help guide implementations of SIPA and filtering and also generate recommendations for future policies to help support information access. So that's the background for, for this, uh, this uh, current Hangout, and I'll turn it over uh, to our next presenter to talk about issues of education and learning. Hello, my name is Christopher Harris. I'm the director of the School Library System for the Genesee Valley Educational Partnership, a services agency in western New York. Uh, what we really talked about when we looked at schools is the very different way that schools uh, interact with and have to use SIPA uh, as compared to public libraries. And one of the main differences is that schools actually are charged to act in loco parentis so that they are focusing on uh, all of the needs of uh, the students and the safety of the students. And, and that means that it's much harder to discuss getting rid of filtering and, and totally moving away from filtering. That said, the uh, restrictions that are often imposed upon students in schools go very far beyond what is required by the law, as we heard in the first part. And uh, indeed, many schools have had much greater success by moving towards a focus on responsible use rather than acceptable use of internet access. And so by focusing the policies on student responsibility, it's much easier for those schools to allow a wider range of access to you know, very beneficial resources, Facebook, uh, YouTube, online word processors, things like that, while also having the ability to then address uh, rogue actions by students who do not follow responsible behavior so that they can be dealt with independently without causing restrictions for all students and all staff really what we want to work towards and what we discussed at the symposium uh, was the move towards a, a common definition, uh, perhaps even a toolkit developed collaboratively between the American Library Association and other educational groups that can address, uh, you know, and clarify the actual requirements of SIPA as it applies to schools, but also look at best practice, uh, success stories in schools that have uh, move towards um, more open access, and even sample board policy language that would help us encourage a, a broader adoption that would allow us to really move towards our shared goal. School libraries, educational administrators, technology programs, teachers, and indeed parents in the community, we're all looking to move students towards college, career, and life readiness. And it's so important in this modern age that college career and life readiness also include that level of flexibility, 
that level of uh, interactivity, and, and that way to really very successfully navigate a complex information environment that can only be found when we give them access to the real internet and help them learn how to work within the real internet as opposed to pinning them off in a fake internet. And so hopefully that toolkit, uh, if it comes together, will, will help provide that information. Uh, we also really talked about the need to, to do much more reach out uh, to parents, the community, um, chambers of commerce, and, and other groups to help them understand how important it is, how much college admissions are looking at this, how much employers are looking at uh, social networks and social interactions, so that we're helping those students make good choices uh, and, and really learn to work, work together. And one way that we can also do that is by working to put out some templates or talking points or um, even PowerPoint type of, of templates that could help with the SIPA mandated public meetings that, that schools have to hold uh, to, to talk about what they're doing to comply. Thank you. Well, and I am Lucia Gonzalez. I am uh, the co-chair, the national co-chair of the Children and Young Adult Services Committee of Reforma the National Association to Promote Library Services to Latinos and the Spanish Speaking. I am also the Library Director of the City of North Miami Public Library. And I'm going to speak about uh, public service, direct service, and specifically within the public library setting and my own experience with the community I serve. Uh, I am going to address that balance between how do we provide, how do we provide our mission, which is um, free access free and open access to information, even when that information is controversial, unorthodox, and unacceptable, right? How do we provide that mission? How do we deliver that mission within the setting of filtering? When filtering is, when filtering is the software used to restrict access to content, and that content is decided, you know, the, the out the um, objectionability of that content is decided by someone remotely uh, disconnected from libraries. I was, saying, I was going to say remotely connected, but no, someone totally disconnected from libraries. Um, so how do we reconcile that when we are providing direct service to our public? How can we still provide the services that we need to provide and uh, filter the information? Uh, filtering has an economic impact and it has an impact on the delivery of our mission, and it also has an impact on the services we provide. Economic, why? Because, number one, we need to invest on filters, and if, it's your, if you're a library like mine, independent library serving 60,000 people, it costs you between $5,000 to $10,000 if you get a relatively decent filter. But if you don't have the money, you're not going to get a relatively decent filter. You're going to get something that perhaps is not going to allow you to provide the best possible service to the community. We all have very tight budgets. Um, economic, because who, ha who uses our services in the public library more than anything? And remember, the public library is the equalizer of our society. So we are providing services to people that don't have access at home or that have difficulties having access, don't have the equipment, don't have the digital uh, skills. So they come to the library, and we are limiting them. We are limiting their access. We're limiting their gaining uh, access to relevant and important information, what they're seeking, right? Economic, yes. Uh, some people call it the digital divide. It may shift the definition of divide, but there is a divide. Those that have uh, their own uh, equipment, those that can go to a, a how do you call that, a, not a blockbuster, a, a Barnes & Noble or a fancy coffee shop and take out their tablets, use teams, including my own children, and access the internet. And those don't, don't have those luxuries. And that, again, come to the public library to access. So those that have the luxury, again, they can access. But those that don't come to the library, hello, you cannot access. So there you go. Uh, it has, um, and uh, okay, so, and I'm talking about economic because, of course, the community that 
specifically it's of interest to me, which is a Hispanic community. There was a, a study, the, the Pew Hispanic Center report, uh, very recent, 2012, said that only 45 percent of the of Latinos have access to broadband. That is, even African Americans at 52 percent and um, Anglo Americans or White Americans at 65 percent. So there is the divide. Uh, my my in my own library, I'm telling you, youth can get around those filters. They know how to. I go up to the computers and I say, how did you get to that site if you're not supposed to be there? Do they tell me how? No. They said, Ms., I don't know how I got there. Of course they know how I got there. They're not going to tell me. Now, oddly enough, it's not the teens that are coming to the front desk to ask for help. It's the adults that are coming to the front desk to ask for help that are making a line to get there to help to to get us to go and unblock the sites that they need to access their nursing tests. We have a large segment of our community that go into the health professions. And believe me, there's a lot of trouble in accessing, accessing sites related to the health profession. So these students are sent to the public library again because they don't have the access from, the, from home to complete their homework, to take tests online, and so on. And they're blocked constantly. And they're adults, they don't have the digital skills to get around the software. The teens do, but they don't. So imagine, we're creating problems on top of everything. So I know I don't have much time, but within the context of our discussion today, we thought that we should be investing, instead of limiting people, we should be investing in research in that in framing this whole conversation within a, in, a positive, in a positive way, doing real research and not just reacting to fears. We should be uh, having a national dialogue, and not investing in a national awareness campaign, educating people about access to education. And again, empowering <coughs> librarians, yes, to be the gatekeepers of information. That's our job. That's what we have been doing before, and we should continue to do that. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Chris Peterson. I am a research affiliate at the MIT Center for Civic Media uh, and on the board of directors of the National Coalition Against Censorship. And I've been asked today to address some of the topics that we discussed uh, here at the symposium on issues surrounding digital inclusion. So many of you may be familiar with the idea of the digital divide. Um, it's this kind of observation um, that not everybody has the internet or has it equally. It's been around for 10 or 15 years. And most of that discussion has been, are you connected to the internet or are you not? A binary on or off switch. Um, usually with statistics thrown around, some of the sorts that Lucia just gave, about do you have any access, whether through dial-up, whether through mobile, whether through broadband, um, or, or do you not have access? And um, now some more fine-grained studies are coming out about whether people uh, have broadband access or no broadband access. But the idea with the digital divide was that um, dig that internet filtering in public libraries and, and schools uh, had disproportionate impacts on people lower down the socioeconomic chain. Um, the reason being that they may not have access at home and that their access in, uh, to the internet was only afforded through their schools and through their libraries, which were now being blocked in particular ways or impeded or hindered in particular ways. Um, one of the things that we discussed here at the symposium was the gradual shift in the discourse from talking about the digital divide to talking about divergent digital literacies. So not only that um, your access may differ from some sort of on or off switch, whether or not you're connected to the internet, but your whole manner of use uh, may differ. How you use the internet, with whom, for what, um, may differ greatly depending on who you are and where you come from that are important to you. Um, a lot of work has been done in this area uh, by Craig Watkins at the University of Texas, uh, by Esther Hargitay at um, Northwestern, formerly of the Berkman Center. Um, and uh, there's some really interesting research being done here at Microsoft uh, Research New England. Uh, so, for example, uh, you may have heard of Grindr. Uh, Grindr is kind of popularly known as an app on uh, mobile phones which helps gay men hook up. Uh, so it's kind of got this underlying narrative of promiscuous sex, um, of, of uh, homosexuality, of um, prurient content, of all these sorts of things that you might imagine would be filtered in a library or in a high school. What Mary Gray at Microsoft Research has found in some ethnographic field work she's done in the Midwest 
is that when you get to areas where that are more sparsely populated um, and where there may be greater socio, uh, social stigma against homosexuality, she's found a number of, of teenagers and, and young people who have been using Grindr to just find gay peers in an area where it may not be safe to come out um, or where there may just not be a lot of people. They may not know a lot of people who are like them, and they use this app to facilitate those connections. Um, uh, Dana Boyd, um, in her dissertation on uh, social media use, one of the consistent things that she found, again, among uh, young people in ethnographic field work, was that how they used MySpace um, differed tremendously by where they were and with whom they were. So when she interviewed, again, teens in the Midwest about um, what MySpace was for, they all looked at her and said, oh, that's stupid. MySpace is for organizing Bible studies because that's what they did with all of their friends. And the critical insight um, here is essentially that um, how these, how websites are used, how web content and all these other things are used has less to do with the national narrative or uh, the people who are devising the uh, categories uh, of the filtering lists on different filtering softwares. What they think these services are for and what they think they use and what the people themselves are trying to use it for. And the other big insight here is that filtering regimes have regressive effects at every point in the socioeconomic chain. So the first big thing, obviously, is if you can't access uh, certain things at a public library or a high school, um, and that's your only access to the Internet, if we're going back to this old kind of digital divide way of thinking about things, then those impacts are really obvious. But it could also be less obvious if you don't have access to Facebook at your high school, um, and it's one of the ways in which you're trying to build social capital uh, among your friends, right? Uh, maybe you can't access Twitter uh, at your high school for some reason, um, but it's the only way that you can communicate with most of your peers um, who have mobile phones uh, and are using it as an alternative to texting plan, uh, or through a texting plan as, because they don't have a smartphone with some sort of data plan. Um, and that's, of course, the case for, um, uh, for many people who use Twitter as, uh, as an interpersonal communication. Um, I think one of the themes that emerged here was that, uh, at our symposium, uh, generally speaking, was just that not enough conversation has been had about how these sort of top-down um, enforced filtering regimes will end up disproportionately impacting the students who are the least well served by our public schools already, by our public libraries already, and by public policy generally. Um, and that's something that we're really looking forward to continuing to develop the conversation around. Michael? So building on these various uh, dimensions of these frameworks that the previous speakers have, have introduced, uh, a group of us sat down to try to identify some research questions. Uh, how can we work together uh, with libraries, schools, academics, research centers, and funding agencies uh, to try to get a better understanding of how filtering is working, how it's being implemented, and what are some of its impacts. So there's a number of different kinds of questions that we, that we discussed uh, and that the group uh, seem to see are things that are worth us uh, pursuing in the future. So one of those has to do with just the, the question of implementation. Um, how are filters being purchased and installed? Are default settings being used? Um, who uh, has the ability to manage those settings? Is it someone within the library on their staff? Is it a central IT department uh, within, the, within the government? Um, who's making decisions uh, between librarians, uh, perhaps attorneys, perhaps uh, IT staff? Uh, when and how are filters being lifted? Uh, how quickly is that happening? What kind of decision process uh, or policy is in place to guide that, that aspect of the implementation uh, of SIPA? And I think additional research needs to be done to get this kind of broad understanding, especially how this might vary depending on the type of library, the location, the population that it serves. Another question that's come up uh, and that I think additional research needs to pursue is the economics of filtering. Um, there's already been a, a, some links put out on, on Twitter for the uh, San Jose Public Library finding uh, that it was more costly to install, purchase, install, and maintain filters than any savings they would get from the E-rate program. So I think additional research could be done to look at that. What are the actual economics of engaging in filtering across different kinds of libraries? Uh, we talked a lot about different kinds of research uh, to really try to hone in on any kind of uh, correlation uh, between educational outcomes and learning 
and whether filtering is taking place in particular schools or libraries to try to determine is there any kind of a link uh, between filtering and the kind of educational experience uh, that students are having. Uh, important to this and something that Chris was just mentioning was the connection uh, between um, the filtering that's taking place and its impact based on um, socioeconomic uh, variables, different kind of demographic variables, getting a better understanding of how different types of users of libraries and different types of students at public schools uh, are being impacted by filtering based on uh, class, race, or other kinds of variables. Uh, we're also very interested in trying to understand how students are actually doing with filters. What's their level of awareness? Um, getting a better understanding of what they might be doing to uh, get around filtering, either through some kind of conscious circumvention um, or using different devices or going to different kinds of locations, and then what are the implications of that? And the same thing with adult users of public libraries. What is the level of awareness? Um, how are they doing with the fact that they might be engaged in information seeking in an environment where some information is being blocked? Uh, so there's some very interesting ways that that could be explored through different kinds of studies and ethnographies. Uh, we feel there should be more research done in terms of messaging. This is something that came up time and again throughout the, the course of the symposium. How should we be talking about this issue of, of internet filtering, how information may be uh, blocked or censored um, uh, from certain computers and to certain viewers, and what's the best way for us to discuss this if we're talking to policymakers, if we're talking to parents, if we're talking to um, library or school administrators, and trying to get a better sense of what, what is the right way to just even discuss and uh, and deliberate over these issues. And a final area for research that we explored had to do more with getting a broad understanding of just what's happening in the land, in, nationwide in terms of filtering. And we're thinking about uh, an initiative like the Open Net Initiative. Uh, if you go to opennet.net, uh, you'll see uh, a global effort to try to track internet filtering in various countries and various types of information. Could we try to recreate something like that focused on SIPA and how filtering is taking place in schools and libraries in America. So these are the different kinds of research questions and there's a lot more for us to think about uh, that, that we saw some ways to help push forward uh, some of our knowledge, gather some more data uh, so we can be better informed when we engage in these kind of policy discussions. And I think we're ready now to open it up for any kind of uh, broader questions. This is Catherine Dice. I'm the ACRL content strategist at ALA, and I'm the facilitator and moderator of this panel. Um, and I'd like to um, pose a question from the audience. We have a, a, a couple of questions uh, from the audience. The first one is, and, and perhaps Lucia, you could uh, address this, does the fact that adults must request that filters be disabled create a chilling effect on um, freedom, uh, freedoms that people feel they have or should have? Well, of course it does. I think that uh, you know when when people have to come up and request to access specific information, that is already you know creating that effect. Um, we are forcing them to come to us, whether you know whatever information they're requesting is private or not. You know we're limiting them, and they're coming for permission. They're asking permission. Now I do want to uh, to say that a lot of times. Uh, I, I, this affects adult patrons again, and many of them sometimes they have limited uh, language skills, and so to you know add to that the frustration of having to ask for permission to access websites or information that they need, add to that limitations that they may have related to language, and I'm specifically talking about new immigrants and how public libraries are the lifeline of new immigrant communities. So that's yeah it is. So are you thinking that um, it can actually prevent people from even asking because they don't want to share what they're looking at um, and perhaps that's uh, that keeps them from ever seeking information that they need? Well, some people may be prevented because they, you know, they may be looking for private issues, private matters, and they don't really feel comfortable uh, talking about it. Others, they just don't want to bother because libraries are very busy and they have to, you know, wait and wait for their turn. Uh, I think most of our, of our libraries, our public libraries, are very sensitive to providing access. We don't ask us questions. We just try to protect that privacy of our patrons. Uh, but still, it's putting them through having to come to us and be intermediaries of information. 
Thank you. That that disintermediation doesn't. Uh, it's it's a fundamental. Uh, the, the fact that we try to strive for open and free access to information, uh, certainly in this country, uh, this t stands in the way of that. It seems to me. Um, for Chris. Um, there's a question from the audience. What is happening in schools where there are no filters or minimal filtering that is not uh, that is not happening in lockdown schools? Well, schools that, that have less filtering are much more able to engage in a larger conversation and a larger learning space. Uh, there are wonderful examples of schools that may be hundreds of miles apart where because of daily interactions via Skype and Twitter and uh, other uh, powerful social tools, the students are, are able to collaborate with other students in a different type of school or in a different type of library. They're able to engage in shared learning and shared uh, discussions. And uh, you're able to do just really cool things. You're able to reach out to experts on Facebook. Um, you're able to, to follow things that are going on in the world. You're able to become not just consumers of information, but producers of information. In, in other schools where, where SIPA has been uh, stretched out to perhaps uh, you know, block things in, in many cases, uh, up to and including online word processors, because you know, the, the, as the argument goes, someone could copy and paste a, an image into a word processing document. Uh, and so anywhere that you have that type of interaction, anywhere that users are creating content uh, seems to get blocked. And that just shuts down the conversation and it turns everything into a one-way interaction. And what we're really pushing towards uh, in the Common Core Standards and in all of these other uh, conversations, that college and career readiness, conversations have to be two-way. You really have to be a, a producer as well as a consumer. To be successful, you have to have that access to all of the resources that are used. Thank you, Chris. Uh, the, there's a sort of a follow-on, I think, uh, to this, and that is how how is Web 2.0 and collaboration impacted by filtering? I don't think I've said Web 2.0 in a long time, but um, this is a question from our audience. How, how is this, the ability to collaborate? And you, you were just talking about how some schools miles apart, hundreds of miles apart, could collaborate, uh, students could collaborate together. But what is the impact of filtering on, on those who have, have no access to that kind of... Uh, environment? In some ways, um, the, the impacts can be mitigated. Um, for example, in the school library system where I work, uh, I, I have an incredible, amazing team of librarians, um, an incredible group of member librarians that have been very supportive in working with us and providing suggestions, and, and then a team with a high level of, of technical expertise so that we've been able to employ some open source software like Drupal to create uh, simulations of Facebook. And so we, we have something called Fame City uh, that simulates Facebook for biographical research. It's not real though. And, and as I'm constantly reminded in, in looking at, at schools that have opened up, um, they're able to do so much more in talking not just about the educational use, of, of interactions in this sort of 2.0 environment, but also talking about the safety concerns. And as a school administrator, that safety is very important to us. It's just second nature for everybody in schools. We want our students to be safe, but part of keeping them safe after school and throughout the rest of their life is teaching them right now how to use these tools in an appropriate and safe way. And though we can teach them and, and bring in some of the instructional uh, opportunities and educational opportunities to these simulations, we can't really focus on the safety issues without being engaged in a real environment. And so that's why it's, it's so important that the best way to keep them safe is to actually drop back a little bit on the filtering and then teach them safety in the real place. Uh, Michael? 
Oh yeah, just to follow up on some of what Chris was saying, a lot of the discussion during our symposium focused on this idea of helping uh, users, younger users or older users, uh, develop their own mental filters, their own personal filters. I think that's really important to, to just to stress on, on what Chris was talking about from an educational perspective, that unless we expose students to challenging material, uh, to, to, to the reality of what's, uh, in, what information is available online, you're not going to be able to develop those kind of filters. You're not going to be able to develop the right kind of information literacy skills to be able to determine quality information from, from less quality information. And I think, you know, an overzealous application of filters re really does hinder that. Um, Chris Peterson, um, and we know that uh, MIT is a leader in, in, the, in research on media literacies. And uh, when we think about uh, the requirements for future employees, for instance, uh, in terms of media literate, literate uh, capacities and capabilities, um, how does filtering, or does filtering affect the, the capacity for uh, students to become media literate and in what ways does that occur, or maybe not, maybe it doesn't. Yeah, well, I think that um, this ties into some of the earlier questions we were talking about in terms of just developing um, a digital, you know, good digital citizens. Um, I think, and I also think here we need to separate some of the ideas of filtering that are actually specified by CIPA from filtering as it's practiced in schools actually, right? Because um, you know, one can, it's easy to see how one would say, well, we're filtering obscenity out. Um, and uh, why would we ever care about that from the perspective of developing, you know, a good worker, good employee, good student, or anything else like that. But the reality is that schools filter all sorts of stuff, uh, mostly for bad reasons. Um, and that filtering things like Facebook, filtering things like Google Docs, filtering things like Wikipedia, filtering any of these different tools out because you're worried about students wasting time with them or being distracted by them or them potentially containing inappropriate material or unsourced material or unreliable material or any of these different things is foolish. It's just incredibly foolish and it's um, actively harming the effort of developing students who are going to have the skills to succeed in any sort of world, right? You cannot work or get a job or function in, in in many real ways today, in any sort of high capacity, um, without the autonomy to be able to do things on the internet. Um, and students need to develop those things in safe environments like schools where the safety comes not from being blocked from access to things, but rather having the assistance to learn how to navigate those shoals safely. Um, and to what to do when something comes up that's not, that bothers you or what to do, how to treat a source as if it's reliable or not reliable, and, and learn what those mean to make those distinctions on your own. Um, and, you, I mean, research at MIT happens from people going online and looking for things. It happens, I went to a, a, a talk at Microsoft not that long ago about conducting large-scale um, quantitative research, you know, uh, through the web. Um, I can't rightly comprehend the state of mind that would lead someone to think that locking down your internet to an all whitelisted set of television channels where everything we know in there is good and safe and trusted um, is actually going to make anybody better um, at being an adult or a well-functioning member of society um, in the world that we live in today. Thanks, Chris. Uh, thanks, Chris. Um, we have a question about um, the research. Uh, uh, what? What is the impact, or what what role might the might research play on the effects of overfiltering, um, Michael? Yeah, that's a great question, and I think one of the main things that that uh, some more rigorous research in terms of what's happening on the ground can help us identify are some of these unintended consequences of the implementation of filters in, in support of, of CIPA. One of the things that I find interesting, and I think it'd be an interesting thing for us to try to try to understand better is how the entire goal of the E-Rate program, uh, which drives SIPA implementation, is to promote access of information in places that can't otherwise afford it. But the concern that we have is that by installing filters in order to gain access to these funds, we're actually impeding uh, this information flow. 
And so I think if we can uh, generate uh, research to actually show some of these impacts, some of these unintended consequences, then when we're sitting uh, with policymakers, with legislatures, with administrators about how to actually um, implement SIPA, uh, we'll have better information in order to show them that, yes, we understand what, what, what the intent here is with this law, but the way it's being implemented um, is causing these unintended consequences, and we can try to help take some corrective steps in, in future policy, uh, whether it's rulemaking or, or future legislation. I was just wondering if there's an analog with other laws where this kind of implementation reorient, you know, readjustment has happened in the past. Do we know of any of any other acts where where the implementation is rough or or, or there's an overinterpretation or uh, misinterpretation, and then there has to be some adjustment? And it, do we have any other research, any other any other uh, uh, laws that where that is the case, Michael? Well, if we look at instances of, of, of laws that have been ruled unconstitutional, we see things like with uh, CDA or COPA, where there's been attempts to restrict access to information, um, and then after uh, judicial review, those laws are reversed. Uh, in the case of SIPA, and the reason that we're, we're sitting here 10 years later, uh, is that the very similar law uh, attempting to restrict access, the courts found you know, the, the filtering and the lifting of the filter, that, that loophole, uh, to allow it to go into place. Other instances that we've seen in, in more recent history have to do with PIPA and SOPA and some of the other laws that have been proposed, where on their face the laws are trying to do something that, that most people would support in terms of trying to minimize uh, piracy or, or illegal downloading. But when we look at how those laws would get technologically implemented, then all of a sudden we realize there's a problem with the legislation. In those cases, those laws were pulled you know, from consideration, um, whereas SIPA has, has continued through. So it, it, there's some history out there. Thank you, Michael. Um, Lucia, in terms of uh, the you know the the amount of money that is spent on filtering um, and and the fact that uh, on filtering software versus the e-rate, what do you th in your own experience how is this balance um, how does this balance out? Do you have to select one over the other? Uh, well, we're talking about, about E-rate, but also we need to remember that in order to qualify for LSTA grants, you must filter. A lot of libraries can opt not to filter, and I have worked in settings when I, in my prior uh, life experiences in which we opted not to filter, but we were uh, economically uh, able to do that. Uh, I work in a library now that I don't have that option, and I do seek all the funding that I can get, all the additional funding that I can get. So if I want to be considered for an LSTA grant, I need to filter. So uh, it's not just e-rate. Yeah. yeah. Um, we're close to uh, five minutes to the end of this um, uh, Google Hangout. And um, any final comments from uh, from our panelists here? I'd be happy to see the floor to anyone who raises their hand here. Um, just checking. Any final questions from our audience? I'm not seeing any questions yet. Um, I would like to take this moment to to just sort of summarize the fact that yesterday's uh, symposium, um, which is was co-sponsored by Google and the ALA Washington Office, and Office of Intellectual Freedom and Office of uh, Information Technology Policy, uh, took place uh, as a as an experiment in in delving into this topic a little more deeply and to, to try to reach some conclusions about particularly what research needs to be done to understand what's really happening in reality. We have anecdotal evidence of, of certain kinds of effects and impacts, and in some cases that's, those anecdotes are very vivid, um, but we also need, we know we need to have more research done, and so there was a fair amount of time spent discussing the research um, possibilities, as, as Michael has described. So I'd like to take this opportunity now to thank all of our panelists, all of our guests, 
uh, everyone who took part in the symposium yesterday and to particularly thank Google and, and Brittany Smith for uh, hosting us here so graciously and for um, uh, thinking and being inspired to do this symposium and to thank um, uh, all of Washington office folks and the Office of Intellectual Freedom at the ALA office in, Was in Chicago. Um, please, uh, to our audience, please look for a white paper on uh, in the fall synthesizing this symposium discussions and, um, and uh, looking for next steps in research. Uh, we will be posting, um, this is, these two hangouts will be archived on the Google, the ALA Washington office uh, YouTube channel. Um, and so this is ALA Washington office and Google signing out. Thank you.